Hi, I'm Lee for Gaming Lives TV, and this is Gamescom. Coming up in our Gamescom special, Mark gets all gooey with the creators of Borderlands 2. Lee talks to Eric Johnson from Valve about hat shops, esports, and Dota 2. Adam gets some secret details on the secret world. Lee visits indie developer Hello Games for a chat about Joe Danger the movie. Adam talks Star Wars The Old Republic with Bioware community manager Stephen Reed. And Mark talks about playing with his monkey to the developers of Risen 2 Dark Waters. Hi, this is Lee for Gaming Lives. Here we are in Hall 6 of Gamescom. I'm going to take you for a bit of a wander now, show you everything that's in this hall. Uh, it's one of the many halls at the show. Just behind us you can see Space Marine. Um, obviously we already covered Space Marine back at E3. Uh, there will be a link to Ben's preview. Uh, that will be up on the, sort of, if you're watching this on YouTube, it will be in the comments below. Uh, if you're watching it on the website, we'll stick it up on there for you as well. There's not much to show in the way of Borderlands, but if we just look over there, that's all you're getting. Uh, a poster and a Red Bull logo. Um, Mark's Borderlands 2 preview, he was literally one of the first people to see it. That's already gone up on the site, so you'll, you'll be able to read that like right now. Uh, just coming past Activision now, um, they've actually brought some games to this show, which was nice of them. Uh, we've got Prototype 2. New rehash Goldeneye again, uh, and for some bizarre reason, Call of Duty Black Ops. Not too sure why. Uh, over here, we've got a very noisy Diablo 3, World of Warcraft, and Starcraft stage, uh, where there are sort of various announcements and shows and Q and A's and all sorts over the course of the show. Um, there's also a chance to play the new, the new build of Warcraft uh, and the latest expansion pack to Starcraft 2 as well. We should be able to find Ben around here somewhere who will talk to us about what he got to see. Um, it's more Activision booth for you. Why have they wasted half of it on Black Ops? That was, that was nice of them. Here's Ben. Ben! Hello, sweetie. Ben, how do you do, sir? Tired. Tired? Yeah, tired. It's been a long day. It's been a very long day. You got hands on with StarCraft 2 and World of Warcraft earlier. Yep. Tell us what's new. Uh, StarCraft 2, it's all Zerg now, it's not Terran. So everything's completely changed. Um, as I just got back from the presentation from Blizzard now, um, the whole emphasis is on Zerg. So when you're playing, you, you know you're playing as Zerg. Um, you have all the the campaign's fully Zerg, and then it's going to put all the new units in the multiplayer, and so it's going to change all that side of it as well. What about Warcraft? They've got a lot of new features coming to Warcraft. What did they show you? Uh, they've got the brand new raid, 25-man um, Deathwing, which is going to be the last raid for Cataclysm before the next expansion hits. Three new five-man instances. Um, they've also got a couple of new systems, like transmognification, which is really cool. It's like you can get one item um, where it's like the stats are really cool and everything, but, and then take another item where the armor looks cool and combine them. So you get all the best stats with the armor how you want. So you can go and get gear from the new raids, but make it look like the raids from when Warcraft first came out. So it's going to be like vintage clothing in essence. Warcraft's going retro. Yeah. <laughs> What else have you got to see today? Uh, saw a bit of Prey 2. That looks really nice. Um, graphically, that looks phenomenal. Um, bit of a Bioshock feel to it, um, but still looking good. Dishonored is actually quite surprised by. Um, to the, um, the art style, it's like, I won't say it's steampunk, but it's like retro, sci-fi, futuristic-y sort of thing. Like Ooh. running around with like cool guns and swords and stuff. What about rage? What about uh, rage? Yeah, uh, and now we're on rage. Um, yeah, it's just rage. Is it going to be a nice little tie over to Borderlands 2? Fallout and Borderlands had a baby. It made rage. It's exactly that. Exactly. Cool. We're going to take a walk further up there. Uh, we're going to go find Adam and Joe. Uh, 
Adam and Joe are our guys that are here with Electronic Arts. They're covering pretty much all of Electronic Arts. Um, we like to help EA out at times when we can. Um, they're a struggle street publisher. They've been spending a lot of money lately uh, on like mobile phone games and things like that. So it, you know, it's nice to help them out once in a while. We don't want to, we don't want anybody like that to go under. So um, it's quite important to us. Uh, Skyrim booth just behind me. Not really too much that you can see from the outside. They have got one of the dragons. Is it a dragon scroll or an elder scroll that they've got here? A dragon scroll. An elder scroll. Um, answers on a postcard, if you know what that says. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, carry on taking a walk. Oh. Um, we've got Calypso's booth just over there with sort of Tropico and all of the bits and bobs like that. Um, there's the laptops and computer that's on show. Uh, we've got Capcom just over here showing Street Fighter X Tekken. Uh, here we are getting to the EA booth now. They, you know, they brought a MIG. Um, it's a bit of an old one. Uh, like I said, they are struggling. Um, it, it hasn't got any wheels either, so that might be an issue. Um, somewhere around here should be Adam and Joe. I can't see them. Star Wars The Old Republic, just over there. Get sort of a hands-on with the show. Uh, I believe they are showing off some of the sort of home worlds, um, as well as some sort of PvP instances as well. And there's an actual Jedi. Uh, he hasn't got his lightsaber, so I hope I don't get into any trouble. There is Adam and Joe in the middle of the thing, stood there camouflaged. Adam and Joe, Hi. how do you do? Well, There's some very nice t-shirts you've got on there. I know. What's the Battlefield sticker for? We had a picture taken in front of the jet. So is that for like the white balance or? Yeah, no, he's, um, I don't know. I don't know what the sticker was for. I think it's just, they made sure it was in front of the camera, so. I don't quite know what for. Some sort of digital ID, I think, yeah. so we can download the picture. That's very shiny. So, you guys have had a busy day. What have you been up to? Well, a lot of interviews. Back to back, all day. Uh, we have talked to pretty much all the major people. Who was the first guy we talked to? I don't remember. Uh, we've had so many interviews, so I, I'm just listening to the, uh, the audios later to figure that out, I think. You're not sure who you spoke to. Did you get to speak to Ken Ralston? Did speak to oh, Ken yes. um, he graced us with his presence. He is, for everything you've seen of him, the way he talks and he, how crazy he is, he's not putting it on. He is mental. He sat next to us and he, we had the best half an hour long chat with a guy we've ever had. Half an hour with Ken Ralston, that's pretty epic. That's pretty epic. Is there anything you guys are looking forward to that you haven't had a chance to see yet? We still haven't seen Battlefield, have we? Yeah, that's the big one, that's tomorrow. We were going to do it today, but we ran out of time. We had to push a couple of things. Um, you had the chance to play Star Wars yet? We haven't played it. We have sat in uh, with the guys from Bioware who have talked us through it. What about Mass Effect? Have you seen Mass Effect, Joey? Yes, you've seen Mass Effect, I haven't. You haven't seen Mass Effect? No, uh, we didn't have enough time to do it. So uh, he's been, I haven't. We'll uh, hopefully getting that down tomorrow. We'll see. I didn't even get a funny press pass for it either, which you did, so I'll have to queue, I think. Very nice. Did you not get an inflatable sword? It's in my bag. You've got an inflatable sword in your bag. That's pretty cool. And a bug. Adam and Joe, thank you very much. I'm sure you're very busy. Um, it's important that you go off and sort of keep EA afloat. Like we don't want them to no. sort of struggle or anything. Seriously, we, we were chatting to Peter Moore earlier, and he was like, man, I'm glad you got here. Has he still got his tattoo or has he had it removed? I don't know. We didn't ask.
So Borderlands 2 gets his first gameplay demo here at Gamescom. Mark was fortunate enough to see it and you'll be able to read his preview on the website. He also was lucky enough to be able to talk to Scott Kester from Gearbox about the game and its design. Uh, yeah, we're here with Scott, concept designer at Gearbox, to talk about Borderlands 2. Um, first and foremost, obviously the most important question would be, for me anyway, when Borderlands itself came out, it was a bit of a sleeper hit. Were you guys surprised with how big it became so quickly? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we always believed in the product. The product, we, we felt it was great. We felt there was an audience for it, and it, it definitely kind of was a sleeper hit, but as the word of mouth picked up, uh, it's, I just think the game kind of lended itself to that as far as the cooperative nature, uh, that as you keep playing it, you, the leveling up, the, oh, look at what I found, look at this, and I, I think that really kept driving people on, like, oh, you got that gun, I want that gun, can I, can I see that? And we've, we really knew as we were developing the game when we had played the game so much, we still kept playing the game. Or we're doing checking a bug, and we'd still run over to a chest, and we'd look in it, we'd grab it. Even though we knew in a second we were going to hit escape and pop out of that. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, so uh, we knew we were on to something. We were just hoping other people would be. But we're obviously very appreciative of the, everyone who supported it. So. Do we still have all the fancy things in the red crates and the, the crimson crates? Any developer crates hidden there? Yeah, there, there's definitely some surprises in store for different crates and uh, you know things to deliver uh, unique items and whatnot. I'd seen in one of the, the press releases that you could customize the um, the weapons with decals. Is that your own decals? Or is that just what's lying around? No, I, as a, at this moment, the, it, it's still the similar random gun generation system. Like uh, what 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 we had done in the last game. Um, but there's a lot more components, there's a lot more pieces that go into that. There's a lot more variety in what can come out of that. Um, and right now, that's that's kind of what, what where we're sitting, so. Do we still have the class mods and all the, the shields and various things like that? Yeah. Yes, there's still the class mods and shields. Uh, there, there's, uh, just like the guns, we had, we had sort of taken a look at the guns. We redesigned them, we rebuilt them, they have a lot more identity, they do a lot yeah. more unique things. Uh, so does the gear as well. Uh, it has a similar system as far as how the, the shields look and uh, the grenades and yeah. D definitely look forward to even more more things to pick up and use. So, Do we see all four of the previous characters as NPCs this time or just a couple of them? They're all there as a supportive cat. I mean, there's other surprises and people that have existed throughout the game and the DLCs that will be making appearances in the game. So, When I was looking at the demo yesterday, you could see quite far with the draw distance and everything else. Um, is it the same process as before where when you get to an area, it's effectively a load to the next section? Or yeah, it's, it's not a fully streaming. Uh, it's, it's, it's load based, but it just, there's a lot of, it works best for our style of game, but we have increased the draw distances. The spaces are a little larger. Uh, we can populate them more. That's, everything's a little more dense this time around. Yeah. So, yeah. So, actually, the world itself is larger than what was in the last game, but there's just a lot more variety and options of things. Well. Yeah, there's more yeah. life and there's more things to interact with in the world. So, it doesn't feel quite so sparse, perhaps, as the first game. I mean, it's still a wasteland of sorts that's yeah. not inviting by any by any means but it's yeah. less about just vistas and now it's actually lived in environments yeah and that's something that we're really trying to use and like inside of the demo you see a struggle between the bloodshot and the hyperion there's a lot of story that we're telling through gameplay that's we're not stopping you to show you cut scenes we're we're kind of using those environments as set pieces to tell stories as you you just happen to be passing through so Will any midgets jump out of fridges at us? <laughs> I mean, we definitely have surprises in store, so you never know what we can throw into something. So <laughs> yeah, My friend still will not open up a fridge without backing away <laughs> straight away. Um, last question, most important for me really, will Moxie be in the game? Uh, I, I don't know how far I can go into, I, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say, but if people found characters they were they liked in the game there's there's a there's a good chance that you'll see them around this time so Scott, thanks very much pleasure thanks. thank you Volvo here on the show floor showing off Defense of the Ancients 2. 
they're having a competition where a lucky team can win a million dollars if they come first. I had a chance to catch up with Eric Johnson from Valve and talk to him about what they're doing here at Gamescom and also everything we can expect from the game. Hi, I'm Lee for Gaming Lives. I'm joined here with Eric Johnson, a senior producer on Defence of the Ancients at Valve. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Um, Defence of the Ancients, the first game, it started off started off as it was well, it was a mod for Warcraft 3. Coming from that to now having your own game from the ground up, sort of how did you get from A to B with that? Well, it, it started um, with a bunch of people at Valve that were fans of Dota and fans of Ice Frog. So we, we kind of had the you know fans just like everyone else, we really loved the game. And then as developers, we saw uh, someone who by himself had grown this audience of you know tens of millions of people was constantly adding a huge amount of value to those customers, making a lot of good product and game design decisions along the way. So uh, that was kind of the start of it. And we we contacted him and asked him kind of where he wanted to take the product or kind of what he wanted to do. We were pretty excited and, you know, he's the kind of person that we want to work with. And so he, he came to Valve and, and from there we kind of started working on a sequel to the product so that kind of the constraints that he'd been living under in the, the mod amateur world, you know, now he has an art team yeah. uh, and we can, we can build a whole game. So that, that's kind of how it started and kind of our, our thinking behind it. Is it, still, is it still very much sort of his baby, his game, or is there a lot of people that sort of make the decisions on sort of how, how the development process plays out? Well, we try to distribute as many decisions around the company as we can. So, you know, every game we make, it's everybody's baby. I think he's having a ton of fun. It's probably, you know, for him, it's a lot of fun seeing a, a mod uh, that he's worked on for the last six years, uh, you know, with this huge audience built up. And now there's a tournament where one of these teams is going to win a million dollars this Sunday. That's probably pretty exciting for him also. But the rest of the team is just as excited. We're, we're fans of the game and we're fans of him. And, and we're pretty excited to, to put this out in front of everyone. With the game, do you think it's... Is it ever going to be sort of possible, do you think, to get a game like this um, onto the consoles and have it keep that sort of same feeling? Uh, is it something that you guys had ever considered? or? I, I mean, we're pretty focused on PC and Mac right now, but that's just kind of the problem space that we've chose. I, I, I think that there's ways that you could solve it so that, you know, you can play the game in the living room. You know, it's a challenge just like lots of other things you'd have to do for now. PC and Mac is what we're focused on, though. How are you balancing uh, all of the different hero classes that you've got within the game? Um, I mean, do they play a sort of evolves them as they're playing, or is there sort of a bit more sort of rock paper scissors mechanic to them? Well, that that was kind of the thing for us when 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 we were just playing Dota. It was hard for us to wrap our heads around it. We didn't understand how one person could could kind of manage this whole system and still end up with lots of happy customers. And with Dota two. There's a huge number of those types of decisions that have already been made. That uh, all of the fans and the community around Dota and these you know professional players are, are used to. So we're not going to change those things. And so the the game is going to have the same heroes uh, initially as Dota One had that act in the same way. And over time, we're going to just like Dota, it'll move forward, and those heroes will change, and new heroes will show up. Um, but it's definitely a kind of a process of kind of always looking at all the parts of the game and making sure that they're as good as they can be. You mentioned the tournament briefly that you've got going on outside at the moment. Um, that's going to be running for sort of the duration of Gamescom. What's going on for the tournament? How many teams have you got involved? So we invited the top 16 teams from around the world. There's teams uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, uh, Russia, kind of all, all from around the world. Uh, to come and play and uh, the top team will take home a million dollars the total price pool is 1.6 million and for us uh, we just thought it was an interesting way and and entertaining way to show fans the game for the first time Uh, Dota is a game that uh, people want to they always want are looking for ways to learn how to get better at the game we felt like seeing the highest level of competition would be a great way for everybody to see that. So that's a, an exciting way for the fan, fans to see the game. And then for us, uh, on the development side, it's just a really useful way to 
to kind of bring a bunch of clarity around what we need to do to get the game finished, knowing that a bunch of a bunch of people we're fans of, a bunch of these professionals are going to be playing the game here in this event. You know, it meant that we had to kind of go through a bunch of decisions and do a bunch of useful work to be ready for it. I mean, it does. It certainly seems to fit very well with sort of the esports genre, uh, if you like, which is it's becoming a really big thing now. It's uh, obviously it's quite big over in the Far East, but now it is sort of making that jump sort of over into the West. Are you hoping this is going to be sort of one of the big esports titles? Well, I mean, I I think it's a great game to watch. Uh, I don't, I to be honest, I don't really particularly follow the the broader esports scene, um, but I do follow Dota. And uh, it has some qualities to it that make it a pretty interesting game for people to watch, um, and for for players of the game to actually get some some real value out of it. When we brought all the professional teams into the beta that we're running about four weeks ago, everyone in the office was watching them on the monitors. You know, both terrified as to the fact that they're about to play our game, but also uh, pretty interested and amazed at how skilled they were and how quick how quickly they could make decisions that were the right ones and how often they were the right decisions. So uh, as, as a fan, they're, it's just a huge amount of fun to watch these guys play. Is there anything that sort of a lot of the eSports teams had started doing with the game since you'd given it to them that you just, it didn't even occur to you that it was possible? Is there sort of any sort of tricks that they'd found or? They have a base skill level that's pretty extraordinary yeah. and they're just kind of good at everything. But, but Dota's a game that's really about uh, a strategy and good moment-to-moment -moment decision making and so that's the thing that I've been so surprised at is that it's really their ability to think about a hugely complex system on the fly and make good decisions that's so amazing. All of the players in the tournament are extraordinarily skilled but it's the uh, it's the kind of high-level strategy that's pretty amazing to me. Uh, for yourself what's one of the most exciting features for the game, like, what's the one thing that you like? Oh, that's that's the best thing of the game for me. Um, I mean, as a Dota fan, uh, having a way to get a group of your friends together and play a game against like skilled players—that's the thing that's the most interesting for me. Uh, we want to make that easy um, uh, because that's that's kind of one of the things that's really difficult in Dota One right now. Uh, on the kind of development side, or you know, one of the experiments we're going to run is around coaching and allowing an experienced player to teach uh, a new player kind of some of the basics of the game and how to get better. So kind of interested to see how that will work out. Those are the two that kind of right now are most interesting. How would that sort of training session sort of pan out? Is it like you're sort of playing co-op one with one or is one guy talking to the other guy and showing him yeah, sort of what to do? Yeah, the coach would be able to speak to the person that they're observing and yeah. also the, the coach would see that person's cursor and their HUD and be able to kind of tell them about things that are going on as they play. Would there be any sort of benefits to the person that's doing the coaching or just for the love? We do want to have a reward system for those people in the community that are creating a bunch of value for other people in the community. And there's so many different ways that people do that. I mean, that's something that, that we need to kind of understand how we're going to do that, but that's something that's pretty interesting to us. Uh, one of the other big things, particularly in the Valve community at the moment, um, has got to be sort of the hats and the hat shop, and that kind of thing. Are we going to see something similar? I mean, right now, we're, we got our hands full enough with just figuring out how to make sure that the game's fun and that uh, all the existing Dota fans want to play it. We haven't really, we haven't even really thought about. Um, no time for messing with hats. <laughs> what we're going to do? Well, just in terms of how we're even going to make money off the product. I mean, right now it's, let's just make sure a bunch of people want to play the game and we'll figure out the rest, yeah. you know, at some point later. Cool. Well, Eric Johnson for Valve, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Often I am asked, what does a hero truly need? <laughs> much depends upon the hero. Would you be swift? Then for you, I have speed beyond measure. Would you be strong? Then I can grant you...
you the might to overpower any foe. Closer and I will unlock your inner cunning! What does a hero truly mean? That is for you to decide. Okay, so tucked away in the corner of Hall 6 here is the new MMO from Funcom, The Secret World. We saw this at the EA press conference earlier this week and it absolutely blew everyone away. This is a game that looks like it's doing something that MMOs genuinely haven't done before. But we need to find out more about it, so what we've done is we've talked to Joel, who's one of the lead creative designers on the game, and here he is to tell you a bit more about it. Uh, we stood outside the Secret World booth, uh, and I'm joined by Joel Bylos, who's a senior content designer on the Secret World. Joel, Hello. thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Cheers. Okay, so you're here on the show floor today, uh, and you're doing the presentations just behind the closed doors here in the booth. Uh, what are you showing? We're showing uh, a dungeon run in our game, about 30 minutes long, of an area called the Polaris, which is a shipwrecked container ship, which is run aground on an island and it was full of monsters, so we're showing off how a dungeon plays through in the secret world. Uh, and you obviously had the chance to talk to people uh, who are viewing this for the very first time today. What kind of response are you getting from people that are seeing it? Yeah, see, people seem really impressed, especially with some of the monster designs and the way that the combat plays. People seem to be really happy with the way it's flowing and stuff, so yeah, it seems great. Uh, for people who don't know, Secret World, MMO, three factions, uh, this amazing world where any kind of conspiracy theory has come true. It's exciting. How cool is that to work on? Oh, it's amazing. And like modern day setting means we can do everything, you know, computers, cell phones, hacking, everything you want, every way that you can communicate. And then we, we've got all sort of the history of the world to play around with. So it's just, it's fantastic. Plenty of content to deal with. Uh, I obviously, I got the chance to see this yesterday and I was blown away by it. The visuals are outstanding, uh, the quests look like a lot of fun. Uh, but we also got the opportunity to look at the PvP yesterday. Um, can you talk us through the PvP demo you showed us? Sure, so I mean, to start with we showed off the, uh, the mini-games, just the, sort of the smaller battlefield areas where people, uh, the three sides strive against each other. And then we showed off our massive persistent war zones, where there's capture all objectives, they're continually persistent, so they're up 24-7, and the three factions have to fight it out to control those zones, which will give benefits to the entire faction on the server. So even if you don't like PvP, your buddies who are playing in PvP are working for you, so it's kind of cool. Uh, and obviously this is Gamescom such a huge event with all these people. Have you been around the show floor? Is there anything you've played that you really enjoyed? Yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten the chance to get out. I snuck into the Battlefield 3 thing. I avoided the six-hour line or whatever, and man, that, yeah, that game was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fantastic. That's cool. uh, so once Gamescom's all over, is it back to the office for you? What, what, what happens next? Uh, I've got two days in the office, and then I'm off to PAX in Seattle, really? and we're doing some more demo stuff over there, so yeah. Uh, and how far away are we for, for the public to be able to get their hands on Secret World? What's the plan? Yeah, we have beta sign-ups on the 26th of August. That's when we start doing the beta sign-ups on the website. We're rolling out sort of more and more stages of beta. And uh, yeah, I mean, the game is releasing April 2012. Well, that's cool. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us, Joel. I really appreciate it. Best of luck with Secret World. It looks stunning. Uh, and enjoy the rest of Gamescom. Thank you very much.
There's not much here in the way of indie action at Gamescom, but one of the few people that did make it down here are the guys from Hello Games. What they actually did was they packed up their office, shoved it in the back of the transit van, drove all the way from Guildford to Cologne, and they set up the booth which you see behind us. I had a chance to catch up with Sean earlier and talk to him a little bit about their new game, Joe Danger the Movie. I'm joined here by Sean on the Hello Games booth. Sean, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, no problem. Um, you guys up here, you've just recently announced Joe Danger the Movie. Um, big deal for you guys, obviously a little indie developer and now you've got a sequel. Um, what's it like being here at Gamescom? Uh, absolutely crazy, as you can probably hear my voice is completely gone by the last day. And I've aged about five years. But uh, no, it's, it's really good fun, of course. It's really great to just be showing people the game. So I pick it out, so it's cool. It's cool to see people playing it. it makes it real. Um, right, so here we are um, on one of the menu screens. Sort of, how does Joe Danger work? How is it different from the first one? Uh, well, the big difference here is that uh, Joe's kind of graduated, right? He's, he's come to Hollywood and uh, he's a stuntman on Hollywood films, right? Uh, one film in particular, one big movie, which is what the whole game is about, right? You're making this one film and you're making it kind of scene by scene. Uh, so we're at Joe Danger 1, you were on a bike in the middle of a desert, you know, just doing your tricks, kind of, and studs, and kind of in a small time way. Here you're on big budgets, kind of Hollywood blockbusters. And that gives us kind of free reign to go crazy and, and put in whatever ideas we like and whatever fits with that theme. Cool. Um, give us a bit of a walkthrough, show us, uh, show us some of the new yeah, features. Sure. Uh, well, I'll just go into one of the really early tutorial levels, but I say tutorial, we still try to keep them, you know, pretty fun and people seem to be enjoying even these as well, right? Because uh, I hate tutorial, right? Uh, so this is Joe, he's in a minecart, uh, and these levels are kind of, I guess, roller coaster themed, you know, they, they kind of remind me of like, uh, roller coasters being a kid, and they're all about kind of things flying out at you, lots of loop-de-loops, lots of kind of going up high, coming down low. So we kind of want all the different vehicles that we have, and we have a lot of vehicles, to not only just handle differently, but also have a different kind of gameplay theme. So you find carts a bit like that. One of the cool things about it is that we have this little director. So you'll see him dotted around, and he's the one kind of filming the movie. Right, and he's, I would say, roller coaster. I guess, you know, like in a roller coaster where you have the camera and you uh, kind of pull a face as you go past it. That's what he is. So uh, as you go past him, you're trying to, you know, nail the stud as best you can or do some awesome tricks or whatever. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what's being recorded. That's what's going to make it into your version of the movie. Uh, so that's an example of kind of minecart. Something that would be very different would be, say, uh, Jetpack. What sort of reaction from all the fans are you getting about the new modes? Is everybody enjoying it? Is there anything that you guys are, people, that you, maybe they'll give you some feedback on and you think of the changing or? Oh, totally. Uh, you know, you, uh, that's probably one of the main benefits of coming to something like this is that if, uh, you know, if one person in the thousand that you show it to has a problem with something, then that's fine. If, you know, a hundred or fifty people have a problem with something then like you have to sit through that a hundred times my god are you got to go home and change that you know nothing can stop you and, and I think it's really good I mean I don't think in a lot of uh, other development studios you get a chance to do that but because we're so small that's one of the benefits so just booting up the motorbike now obviously the motorbike was in the first game um, is there any sort of changes you made to it this time around yeah, it, it handles differently. This is the, the cop bike, but also we wanted, we didn't want to just recreate kind of Joe Danger 1 levels, right? I mean, that game will always be there and people can play that. So we wanted to do something very different. So when you have the bike in Joe Danger, you're playing very different levels. You're going through city streets, normally trying to chase down some criminals like this, uh, dodging it out between traffic. So that's actually very different gameplay to Joe Danger 1. Um, you guys have, you guys have quite an epic story. I mean, you guys are an indie studio. Um, we spoke to you yesterday. And you, this, all of this stuff here is basically everything out of your office. Yeah. Um, 
just for sort of everybody watching back home, do you want to tell the story of how exactly you got to Gamescom? Well, like you said, it, it is kind of everything out of our office. In fact, the stand is basically the size of our office. So, like a lot of this stuff, uh, is our desks, uh, one of these TVs, I think the one we couldn't film off because it's a little bit bad, that's my TV from home, uh, and uh, all the equipment that's kind of behind all these it is ours too, so laptops, PCs, Xboxes, whatever, you name it. Um, and uh, you know the sofa's ours people have been using it. we pulled it out the other day and we've just found families sitting on it having lunch and things but they're playing the game so that's great so you guys have uh, you got to pack it all up in the van now and drive all the way back yeah you said epic so yeah it, it is a bit epic we uh, pack it all up tomorrow morning i guess like 6 a.m then we drive back uh, in the van, kind of like a band, you know, uh, and then we're flying straight out to PAX after this. So, you know, you asked what it's like being here at Gamescom, but obviously for us to go through that pain, it kind of means a lot for us to be here and kind of show people it's something we're really passionate about, I guess. Well, Sean from Hello Games, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Good luck with the game. Uh, cheers. Thank you. So we're here at the back of Hall 6. Behind me you can see Star Wars The Old Republic's booth. There's a four hour queue currently, waiting to get in for the chance to play the game. Every 20 minutes or so, about 40 guys have been able to go in, sit down, play level one characters and get that starting experience for the game. Everyone's looking to get at launch. Uh, in the middle of the booth, what you've got is this huge stage where the lead designers and developers for the game have been demoing off some of the higher end content. Uh, and showing what the game has. Uh, the guy who's been in control of all of that has been Stephen Reed, Bioware's Global Community Manager on the Old Republic, and we took the opportunity to stand and talk to him for five minutes uh, about the fans' response to the game. Hi, this is Adam from GamingLives.com. Uh, we're out here at Gamescom with EA UK all week, uh, and we're here in the Star Wars The Old Republic booth. Uh, I'm joined by Stephen Reed. he's the Community Manager uh, for Star Wars The Old Republic. Hi Steve. Hello, how are you doing? Alright, thank you. Um, you've just been demoing on stage, uh, kind of a live mission. Uh, can you talk us through the quest and what we've just seen? Sure. Uh, we were just showing um, what we call the Origin World, um, for one of the eight classes in the game. Uh, this is the Sith Inquisitor. So the Sith Inquisitor is kind of vaguely modelled after the Emperor. You know, your classic kind of uh, dark side force wielder, uh, throwing around force lightning and generally being pretty evil most of the time. Although, the nice thing about the game is you could choose to play them nice, if you like to. Um, but uh, that particular quest ends up in an interesting situation. You've, you've come to uh, the planet of Korriban, uh, which is the Sith homeworld, and um, you're a slave, you've just been released from captivity. Uh, and you're sort of there to prove yourself and you end up um, having to basically uh, interrogate a prisoner to prove that you're you know you're worthy of doing that so you have some interesting choices which can lead you to interrogating them in certain ways um, and uh, well you know we were trying to do it in an interactive way and the crowd was calling for uh, uh, vicious interrogation so that's what I was doing awesome um, you've got about 20 to 40 computers set up for people to come and have a look yep. uh, and then you've got this incredible crowd that have just kind of been amassing out the front of here cheering getting involved uh, as community manager how much have you enjoyed getting this opportunity to interact with all the fans it's great I mean uh, I'm not German so <laughs> I don't get to interact as much as maybe as I would do at other shows where I could where I could talk the language um, but it's still awesome I mean Gamescom is just a massive massive show you know the biggest in the world um, but, you know the German audience is just super super passionate about uh, about you know PC games and MMOs and obviously they're big fans of Star Wars and we're seeing uh, there's more and more international you know visitors here I met a lot of guys from uh, the UK yesterday some French guys you know people from Holland and all over the place so uh, there's a lot of people who come here and it's it's you know really exciting to to see them play the only problem is you know we can't put enough PCs on the stand you know we have we have a line out back which is probably four to six hours long right now uh, and it's been that way since first thing this morning so we try and get as many people through as we can but you know we uh, we just you know we can't get them through quick enough really uh, and it's the last day of Gamescom today which is very sad um, but 
Back to the office on Monday, is it? <laughs> uh, no, I get on a plane on Monday and I go to Seattle um, in the US. I'm actually based in, in Austin, Texas, which is where the studio is. Um, but yeah, I'm going to Seattle and we go to another show. We're going to PAX next week, uh, back to back this year. So yeah, no rest. Uh, and obviously after that's all done, um, where's Star Wars headed from here? How close are you guys to getting ready to put this out there? We're pretty close. Uh, we've been saying that we're targeting the end of this year, which is what we still are targeting. Um, we don't have a precise release date yet. You know, we don't really feel that we'd like to put out a release date, and then if you know we have issues, you know, then uh, we may miss it. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we deliver the service at the quality that we want to deliver it at. So you know, that's what we're aiming to do. Um, we're going into really high scale and large large-scale testing uh, later on uh, this year um, in US and the uh, and Europe so a lot of people will get to, you know to try the game before before it's uh, before it's out there and also we have pre-order available now um, so people can pre-order the game right now and they get early game access um, uh, sort of ahead of the actual official launch and a couple of other sort of special pre-order bonuses as well okay cool well thank you very much for your time Stephen I uh, really appreciate you talking to us and uh, all the best with the game thank you very much thank you. Uh, for gaming lives .com out here in Germany for Gamescom with EA. Uh, I'm Adam Freeman. See you soon. A Jedi will always seek the truth. I will study the mysteries of the Force and act with calm and clarity. I will expose the dark side's deceit. Fight our allies. And with the force on our side, justice will prevail. Wherever on the tropical paradise there is the Risen 2 booth, in Risen 2 you'll get to play as an undercover pirate. Mark caught up with one of the game's developers for a little bit more information. We're here with Daniel from Deep Silver. We've just seen a preview of Risen 2, which is about 15-20 minutes, um, which looks pretty spectacular. So, if we've taken the character from the first game, but you've stripped him of everything that he has before, what happened how did he actually meet up again with patty because the last time we saw it she had just disappeared steelbeard had disappeared and now they're all back together what happened in the interim yeah okay so the story of risen 2 is actually happening 10 years after risen 1 and when you start risen 1 we're starting in the city of caldera the last vanguard city of mankind uh, which is actually under siege by titan lords and their minions the titans and uh, when you're starting there, you're starting alone as an Inquisition soldier. And one day, actually, Carlos, the, the officer there, uh, asks you to, to look out on the sea with, with a spyglass, and you're discovering that the ship is actually attacked by creatures. You know, a big crack actually wraps around the ship and sinks the ship. And uh, he tells you that, you know, we have to do something against those krakens and those, those, those monsters out there. And um, so he also tells you that, you know, there might be survivors from the ship, ship so go downstairs to the, to the beach and just look if there are any survivors. And when you go down to the beach, actually, the survivor you find is Patty. 
And uh, so Patty actually, you know, right before in the game, the game this is very depressive, you know, you, you just lost the sense of your, why you, you're doing all that, you know, and, and suddenly, of course, with Patty, you know, um, spark. yes, yes, the this, this spark is back again, you know, life makes much more sense again. And um, so Patty actually tells you that uh, she knows where her father is. She's, uh, he's actually in Takarigua, you know, a sugar plantation island from the Inquisition. And she also knows that he might know how to kill those creatures. So uh, then you're talking with the Inquisition guys and you're actually developing a secret kind of mission. Uh, you have to infiltrate a pirate faction to, to get this very special weapon. Uh, and Patty is going to, to make the introduction with her father and make sure that you're getting into his crew. So are you effectively a double agent then? Absolutely, yes. So there will still be things you're doing for the pirates at the same time as you're doing things for the Inquisition? In the beginning, yes, but actually the whole story arc of the game is of a guy who starts off in Inquisition and in the end is becoming a pirate captain himself. So, so there is not a, a, um, you don't have the option to play like the Inquisition to the end. Um, which is also uh, uh, understandable because when you look at what the Inquisition is doing in the outpost of Takarigua, you know, having slavery work done, uh, uh, they don't really care about the slaves, what they're doing, and they're very stuck up and posh guys. You know, you don't really stick one with, with those guys. Actually, when you're running over to the pirates, you see that they are actually the type of guys you really want to hang out with. They really love booze. Um, uh, which is also not, not really only like the term for alcohol in this game, but also there is even the NPC is called Booze who is selling the rum there. <laughs> and he's like the, 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 the top shot of the pirates uh, and, and Steelbeard is his old friend. And uh, when you meet up with them, you decide that, you know, maybe the pirate faction is not really only dirty and anarchic, but really they are really lovable people. And uh, so you actually really join up with the pirates in the end. I was playing the game yesterday downstairs, it was in German, I had no idea what I was doing and I, I pushed a button and a monkey appeared yes. and all of a sudden I was controlling this little monkey guy who ran across to a crate, I don't know whether I emptied it or whether I just closed it but um, how did that come about? Well actually you know when you're talking about the pirate game the first thing is of course you want to have to have priority skills you know yeah. you really want to give the player an, a range of assortment of also mischievous skills uh, in the pirate world and uh, there are many of those you know dirty trick skills like throwing sand in the eyes of people um, attacking them with a trained parrot to annoy them during fight um, you can throw coconuts at them and hit them unconscious uh, and also of course you have your own trained monkey and the monkey is very peculiar because when you're running around NPCs will react on that they will say oh small monkey you want a cookie you know then when you when you see actually you're running across them in the house they will actually follow you to say don't really steal little monkey you know, and then when they see that you're stealing they're going to try to kill you so uh, the monkey is really a very nice mechanic where you just sneak around you know in some on some place actually there is a back window and there's a crate on this back window. you can jump in the windows you know go there steal stuff go outside again and then give it to your own player again so it's like a like a I would say a remote control yeah. Uh, mechanic which actually is also very handy in dungeons because in some dungeons you're entering a dungeon and as always in Piranha Bytes games you never know what's in there you know they're like handcrafted every time so it's not random generated but it's really like unique and also the traps are unique and sometimes you have to pull a lever and when you're standing like uh, you know on, on one side and actually you see there is a, a I say monkey sized hole yes. in the wall you see like oh yeah I have to get out my monkey and crawl in there and and pull the lever. Does it become instinctive? Do you remember that you can send the monkey in? Yeah, because yeah. in the first game, I would be standing in a room for ages thinking, how can I get out of here? I can see that there's light through there and I never think to use the Nautilus spell, Absolutely. but it just makes sense, just shrink and go through. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was thinking about, that when you mentioned the fact that it could pull levers and things, so you can get out of dungeons with the monkey and things like that. I think it's also um, a little bit easier this time because um, simply of the size. Because the Nautilus, you know, um, we decided in Risen 1 to, for example, when you have a Nautilus which is like yay high, you know, you don't make like this hole in the wall. So you actually also make a small hole. Unfortunately, in a very pitch dark dungeon, a small hole like that, you know, in this, you can't see it, right? However, you know, when you have a monkey, the holes, the holes are bigger, like it's like the half your body, you can't kneel down and sneak, so you have to have another way to go through, and then you're instantaneously thinking about your monkey, because that's how you do it. Risen was by far the most difficult RPG I had played at the start, not so much 
middle to end, but at the start when you had those sort of um, the vulture creatures on the beach and you had a stick. And for the first hour or two playing the game, I was just dying constantly. But it made me want to play the game more because it was just stubbornness. Are we going to see the same sort of levels of difficulty? Um, I would say that when you choose the highest difficulty level in Risen 2, it's going to be quite similar. However, I think what you're also saying is not only that the game is difficult per se, but especially in the beginning. And that's what we changed uh, in, in, in Risen 1 a little bit, uh, in Risen 2 a little bit. So in Risen 1, actually, the home game world worked like a funnel. You know, you started with a huge game world and your choices got narrowed down. Yeah. And uh, for Risen 2, actually, we, we are now putting the funnel upside down. So you're starting in Caldera, which is a very limited location. In the, at the beginning, you will return the Caldera, will open up, uh, so it's going to get bitter. But in the, in the very beginning of the game, it's quite limited. You're going to start there, and the guy, the guard, actually, uh, 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 in the, in the um, fortress, when you want to go down to the beach to rescue a Patty, actually, um, you, he's not going to let you out if you haven't equipped your sword, for example. So we really made sure that in this very small playground in the beginning in Caldera, we want to make sure that the player really gets how to equip his sword, how to make some basic fight moves. Uh, you, can't, you basically can't really die unless you're really very, very creative in dying. Uh, but uh, apart from that, you know, you can't really die in Caldera, which is like the first 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, if you're really a core player, hey, you can also rush through like in 10 minutes because you already know how to equip stuff and so. So we don't really want to to, to um, slow down their core players, you know, they can enjoy the game in, in, in the pace they really enjoy it. And the beginners, you know, we give them a little bit of a hand, you know, and also like in Tecarigua, as you saw when you start the game, um, there are people talking about, you know, dangerous areas, they're giving you warnings where you have to go or you shouldn't go unless you're properly geared. So um, we really wanted to make um, the game really also predictable in a kind of way in the beginning, you know. Um, later on, actually, you know, we can torture people enough, you know, with with, with, <laughs> with surprises and stuff. So, so uh, the game is, you know, between 40 and 60 hours long. So there is no reason to to make the the beginning particularly hard. You know, you can ramp up the the learning curve later on as well. That's no problem. And the game will require some skill, as you saw in in our demo. You know, you really have to have some timing in the in the blows you're dealing, and. Uh, the, the guards, they're really tough in their armor and you know they, they really have some good protection and uh, they are hard to, to overcome and you really have to be a little bit creative to, to fight against them when you, don't, when you don't have proper gear. Patty and Steelbeard, how much of a role do they actually play in the game? Are they there from the beginning to the end? A very big role actually, because Patty is going to be a helmswoman on the ship. So, so sh if you want to change to another location, just talk to Patty and she will take you there. And uh, Silbert has also a very important role in the game, yes. Do we get to hook up with Patty? To go into the, too much details because the story is very important for the players to, to, to enjoy themselves. So uh, that's also why we, for example, you know, I showed you in the, in the very end of the demo, a very big guy, yes. a very ancient creature. And uh, that's the only thing you're going to see from that creature. We're going, not going to show it outside of this room. We're not going to show it anywhere else. You know, it's teased a little bit in the very end of the in-game trailer, but the rest really the players have to discover themselves. You know, we don't want to make like one feature trailer for every boss because then you know, like, well, you know, you know all the bosses. There is no surprise. What you really want to have is like the feeling of someone going down with a torch through a pitch black dungeon, and suddenly there is a huge room, and you wonder. Why is this huge room there? And suddenly, <laughs> like, it's a huge guy there in this huge room, and you have to fight him. So um, yeah, that was like the first time I saw the super mutant Behemoth in Fallout 3. I thought, why am I in this huge domed room? There's no reason. Oh, that's that, why. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so this feeling, like, oh yeah, wow, that's really cool. We want really to keep that, even though we have to communicate the game, even though we have to talk about the game all the time. We really have to. We really want to keep some secrets. It looks quite far on, but you said it's still a beta. How long are we looking at before the release then? Uh, the release window currently is first half of 2012 uh, for uh, PC, PC, Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. We're also aiming at a, a simultaneous release. Daniel, thank you very much. Thank There are always beings endowed with special power. 
chosen by the gods to determine the fate of the world. An ancient prophecy says on the day they are freed, the age of destruction will begin. I told my chaps I'd given you a dishonorable discharge due to inappropriate behavior. <sighs> Go bother someone who gives a damn. Saving the world means saving all of it. Even the Inquisition and their ways, and not just the parts of it that suit you. You're on Captain Steelbeard's ship now. What the hell happened here? Death is close. <laughs> Right, so that's it for Gamescom 2011. A big thank you to everybody that we spoke to over the last couple of days. A big thank you to you guys, our readers on the website. If you just happen to have picked this video up by random, you can check out the website at www.gaminglives.com. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash gaminglives, and you can follow us on Twitter at gaminglives. That's your lot. Thanks for coming.